In the 18th century, most people of African descent lived in the low country of South Carolina. The low country held most of the large plantations worked by enslaved African and African Americans. When cash crops like sugar and rice started to decline, many enslaved Africans ended up in the Carolina Piedmont. Slave owners decided to expand farms in the upper part of the state and create larger plantations. Around 1766, a Scots-Irish immigrant named Colonel William Brett settled here in York County. What started out as a small farm soon became a large, wealthy plantation in later years. At the time of Colonel Bratton's death, there were 23 enslaved African Americans on the plantation. By 1843, there were 139 enslaved African Americans on the plantation. Today, we'll see how the Bratton plantation flourished at the hands of the enslaved who worked the land. By 1793, the invention of the cotton gin came along. It was invented by Eli Whitney, and this invention was very important to plantations. It sped up the time of removing cotton seeds from the cotton plant. Meanwhile, the need for field workers who worked in the cotton fields or helped harvest cotton would have increased because of the cotton gin and the increase of cotton produ production. But plantations weren't the only ones who benefited from this. It would have been northern bankers and the textile industry as well. So guys, let's talk about a gin. Now this gin we have here at Historic Brattonsville, this dates to 1920s. It was donated from Clemson University, but the mechanism and how it works was pretty much identical to the original one that Eli Whitney used. Um, it works almost like a strainer system. What we'll see as we look in here is you'll see a series of wheels. Now these wheels, they have uh, teeth. Now Eli Whitney's had a hook system, but with these teeth right here, all the teeth are pointing in the same direction. And what that does is that grabs that cotton, as you see there. Now, as that wheel rotates upwards, um, these things have a little small little slit here. So it's small enough for the cotton to go through that slit, but not large enough for the cotton seed itself to go through. So as that cotton enters the machine, we see the cotton seed drop down in the bottom. Now, once it gets in that machine, there's a series of brushes, and those brushes will pull that cotton lint off of these wheels and in turn, put it in our back pocket. So after it goes through those brushes, it falls in this back hopper. And what we have here is gin cotton. Now this stuff is super fluffy. Um, you know, we talk about cotton candy. This is how I got its name here. Now this cotton is really, really light. And so the next step after it's gin, then they would put it in a press. And the press would have probably been used with a horse carousel system. It was a pit in the ground that used a screw press. And it would compact this all the way down until we got to somewhere between four and 500 pound bales. Now, once we have this four or 500 pound bales, at that point, it would have either gone up north because we've already hit the industrial revolution. So those manufacturing facilities up north was using a lot of cotton, or it would go across the ocean to England. Now let's talk about the daily impacts of cotton production on the lives of the enslaved. It was a very hard life. You know, they work from the can to the can't, meaning they work from the time you can see to the time you can't see. To get an understanding how long the days were, how hard it was for them, you know, they were eating breakfast before sunlight, then they would come out in the fields, work all day. They would have maybe 30 minutes in the middle of the day. They could either bring their ash cakes with them or create a little fire by the fields. And then they had to work all the way up until the sun set, and then that's when they have dinner. So you think about the summer months, how long that day is. You're talking about eating breakfast at 6 o'clock in the morning and maybe eating dinner at 8, 9 o'clock at night. Now, planters prioritize the profits of cotton over the lives of the enslaved. Skilled enslaved workers were trace people who had very talented skills, including blacksmithing, carpentry, masonry, sewing, and other valuable hands-on skills. However, the value that was placed upon them depended on their skill set. For example, a man named Adam, who was enslaved at Brattonsville, was a blacksmith whose value was set at $319.20 in 1843. That would have been just over $11,000 in today's money. These men and women were important to the operation of the plantation, but also their surrounding communities, as they were often hired out to complete tasks on other plantations or for local businesses. The Homestead House was the home of Dr. John Simpson Bratton, his wife Harriet Rainey Bratton, and their 14 children. While this was home, 
for the Bratons, it was a place of involuntary servitude for the enslaved. This home was where a great deal of domestic work would have taken place. Domestic workers would have been tasked with caring for the children, cleaning the home, taking care of laundry, and preparing and serving meals to the Bratons and their guests. Many enslaved women worked as wet nurses. These women were expected to care for the Bratton's babies and nurse them, sometimes before nursing their own. As house servants, domestic and slave workers would have served the Bratton's meals throughout the day and during special gatherings. However, the meals would have been cooked outside in the brick kitchen. The enslaved who worked in domestic settings had to care for their owners and their children on top of caring for their own families. Yet these individuals were still viewed as property with no rights under the law. Skilled and domestic enslaved people did all of the non-agricultural work on the plantation. Domestic enslaved people usually worked in the house or in the brick kitchen like where we are now. In the brick kitchen, it would have been mostly women and maybe some children helping out. These women would have cooked for the Bratton family and their 14 children throughout the years. The enslaved people were often given weekly rations of food. Um, some of those rations included cornmeal, uh, pork, sweet potatoes, collard greens, just to name a few. And with pork, for instance, enslaved people gave birth to the southern barbecue that we know today. They were often given pork as part of their weekly rations, and it was usually the internal organs or the feet or the fat back or head of a pig. And they would season it with spices, spices that they were familiar with that they would have used in West Africa and also vinegar. And spices and vinegar are also the base of Southern barbecue sauces that we know today. Enslaved people were often allotted a small patch of land to plant some vegetables. A few of those would have been corn, collard greens, sweet potatoes, okra, and peanuts. Another African staple that enslaved people used in their foods was okra. Enslaved people also knew how to cook with sweet potatoes because they were familiar with yams. Yams were a very important vegetable in Western Africa and they used those recipes to influence how they would cook sweet potatoes here in North America. Enslaved people were given about 10 pounds of cornmeal per week per adult, and then children would get about a third of that ration each week. On the 1860 census, there were 80 enslaved people listed and there were 20 brick dwellings. We don't know exactly how many uh, enslaved people would have lived in each of these brick dwellings, but if you divide 80 by 20, it's about four if we're thinking about just a regular family with two adults and two children. However, there's no way of knowing for sure as enslaved families would have been shifted throughout the years. Enslaved people would have spent a uh, little time in these structures. However, they are very important when understanding the structures of enslaved families. Now, they would have had between parents and children, normal parent and children relationships. Children would have listened to their parents, but children also would have been disobedient at times to their parents. However, the relationship that they had was slightly different from when we look at maybe families today because their lives were still ruled by slavery. Slave owners were still and control over the parents and the children of enslaved families. Enslaved marriages were not recognized by legal contracts like a marriage license because enslaved people were seen as property. Now, there were debates amongst slave owners during the time about whether it was good for enslaved people to marry. Uh, one of the arguments was it would be best for an enslaved man and woman to marry because they'd be less likely to run away. At least that was their thought. So this is where the idea or the tradition of jumping the broom to seal or celebrate a marriage on plantations amongst enslaved families came from. Hi, I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm the preservation specialist at Historic Brattonsville. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about some of the um, restoration work that we've done on our original slave buildings here.
So we are recently been restoring and almost come to the completion of the restoration of our original slave house in Derry. The slave house is the building that you can see in the background here, and the Derry is the building that I'm standing beside right now. So just to give you a little bit of background on slave buildings here at Brattonsville, we know that in 1843, there were 139 people that were enslaved here at Brattonsville. According to the 1860 census, there were 80 people at that time, and those people were living inside of 20 slave houses here on the property. So the eight buildings that we can account for were all brick structures. And that is notable because um, at this time when these buildings were being built, brick was considered to be a finer building material than wood. It was um, expensive, it was thought of as being more durable. And at this time, the Brattons were building the homestead house out of wood. So we don't really know why they chose to build the slave buildings out of brick, but it was likely a show of their wealth and status. So this building here is the dairy. Um, we believe that this probably served a dual function. Um, it's interesting because this building has a basement. This is the only slave building that has a basement. Um, we believe that in that basement is where dairy products would have been stored and processed. So the basement um, provided a cool place. It also had ventilation windows um, that would have allowed cool air cross breezes to come through and to keep dairy products cold. So the ground floor, the main level of the dairy building, probably served as additional workspace for enslaved people and also housing. Um, we know that 1860, there were 80 enslaved people here living in 20 buildings. So that puts about an average of four people per building. Um, as you can see, this is a very small structure. It's about 300 square feet of floor space. So it's difficult to imagine four people crammed in this building and probably more earlier um, when there were more enslaved people living here. So we're very fortunate to still have these buildings standing especially in the condition that they're in. They retain a whole lot of their original materials and integrity. Um, for example, the joists that you see here are hand-hewn. So when you look closely at them, you will see the tool marks from when they were actually shaped and cut using hand tools. So these were made before uh, lumber was being sawn at a mill um, in South Carolina in the upstate. We also have the original window frames um, if you look at the window frames in each of the corners, you'll see that there is a, a peg. So these were held together with pegged mortise and tenon joinery rather than nails and screws. So that tells us that they are likely very old and probably original. We also believe these to be the original doors. These are board and batten doors, so they're very simple construction. They're made of vertical boards that are held together with horizontal battens. And once we removed these and removed some paint, we were able to clearly see that they had their original 19th century nails, as well as their hardware, their strap hinges and pin tools. So now we're standing in front of the slave house. So the restoration of these buildings has occurred over a three-year period in multi-phases. The first phase was documentation. So documentation is really important for any preservation project to document the conditions of the building when you start the work. Um, in 2017, we had a summer preservation intern who meticulously measured, photographed the buildings, and created a set of measured drawings. In phase two the following year, we did masonry restoration. So this included rebuilding some areas of deteriorated brickwork, um, cleaning the buildings, repointing. Repointing is the process of removing deteriorated mortar and replacing it with new mortar. And in doing that, it's really important to match the original material. So we did analysis of the original mortar and we found that it was a mixture of lime and sand, also with added clay. We know that clay was an abundant material here and it was probably added to extend the mortar and it also lended this sort of orangey red color of this mortar. So we were able to recreate it by mixing in clay as well as mixing different types of sands to replicate the original material. So one of the interesting features inside of the slave house is the presence of fingerprints in some of the bricks. And this is not uncommon in historic handmade bricks. 
it's due to the process in which the bricks were made. So bricks were made in molds. A brick maker would have packed clay and sand into the mold. Um, and then it would have been emptied and allowed to dry for a period of time before it was fired in the kiln. It was during this drying process that if the bricks were handled too early or moved, the brick maker might have left fingerprints in the bricks. Uh, you might also find prints from animals, so deer hoofs or you know cat or dog paw prints. But this is a, just a particularly good example here of fingerprints in the bricks. We don't know whether the bricks were made here at historic Brattonsville. It's definitely a possibility because it was fairly common for bricks to be made at plantations, usually using enslaved labor to uh, produce bricks. We are actually doing some more research into that question currently. We've taken samples of bricks from the slave house, the dairy, and the two ruins of two original brick structures. We're having them an analyzed so that we can compare the chemistry and the mineralogy of the different bricks, try to determine whether they were all from the same source and possibly whether they were made at Brattonsville. So that would give us a lot more insight into interpreting these buildings. So phase three of the restoration has been restoration of woodwork. So that includes window frames, door frames, and the two original doors. So we have tried to save as much of that original material as possible. We do believe the windows to be original. We've also created new shutters. We used reproduction hardware for those shutters that was based on an original pintle that we found in the dairy. So the work is nearly complete. Um, this is the last of the slave house windows that we are currently working on and we plan to reinstall that window sometime this summer. Another component of the slave house restoration has been the restoration of the interior finishes. We knew from paint analysis that this building originally had lime wash coatings. It was never painted with modern paint, so we chose to restore that lime wash finish. You can see it has a sort of translucent look. The brick kind of shines through in some places. We also restored the shake roofs on these two original buildings as well as the reproduction slave buildings. So we believe the roofs were originally made of shakes. We found evidence of that because there was an oak shake um, that we found in the attic level of this building. Um, traditionally, shakes would have been made by splitting pieces of wood off of a log by hand. So using hand tools, you'd end up with a hand split surface on both the top and the bottom. Current methods for creating these involve using a saw to saw the underside, um, whereas the top is typically hand split. But for this project, we used custom shakes that were hand split on both the top and the bottom, so that when you're standing in this space looking up, you're gonna see that hand split surface, which is more historically accurate. So this is one of the two original brick slave building ruins that we still have here. Um, in the background, you can see to the right is the dairy, and then to the left is one of the reconstruction buildings that was built on the foundation of the original building um, in the 1990s. We're very lucky at Brattonsville that we have these two original slave buildings and that they're in the condition that they're in. It's fairly uncommon to have slave buildings that are still standing on these rural plantations especially to have so much of their original building materials and building fabric intact. With these buildings, we really had very little in the way of documentation. The earliest images we had were from the 1960s or 70s. So when it comes to questions like, what type of roofing did these buildings have? What did the shutters look like? What did the window grills in the dairy basement look like? We really have to rely on physical evidence and in some cases doing research of comparable buildings and making a decision based on that. It's really important to preserve enslaved spaces because they provide a physical record of the period of our country's history in which people were enslaved and forced to live and work on plantations. Uh, having a structure where you can stand, and, you know, be inside that building really helps to interpret and understand um, the lives of the people who were enslaved here. Oh, greetings everyone. My name is Wally Cathcart and I'm a descendant of, uh, of one of the enslaved here from Brattonville.
My grandmother Fanny was born here in 1868. Her mother Lila, who was uh, enslaved here uh, prior to the, uh, the proclamation, she was 23 years old at that time. My, my grandfather Lawson Cathcart was born in the 18, late 1850s. He's a 57 to 58, and which made him about seven years old in 1865. He had a very clear memory of that period. And my older brother Crawford and I spent a lot of time with him. And so we learned a lot from him. He would talk to us about that period, uh, but out of the presence of my aunt, because persons of her generation didn't want the issue of slavery discussed, but we would get him out of their presence and we would ask him questions. He would answer those questions. And he told us things about 1865 that he had very clear memory of, that there was a very confusing time, he said. Uh, he remembered the Union Army come, occupying this area. You know, they occupied the South after the war was over. So he had a very clear memory of the Union Army in this area. But we learned so much from him. He was a very skilled man. He, though he wasn't literate in the sense he couldn't read, but he could make anything. He bottomed chairs, made coffins, or uh, uh, made tables and chairs. Uh, he was even a gin mechanic. I was told that whenever the gin broke, they had to go find Lawson Cathcart to repair the cotton gin because the cotton gin had to continue. So I have some two, a two, some leftover tools from him. This is a draw knife. This was for making and shaving bats and. Uh, Two uh, axe handles. My brother and I used his tools when we were growing up, and we made our bats and whatever we do with using my grandfather's tools. So this is about the only thing that I have left from him. So I have I was very much inspired by him. We call him Pap. We were very, very much, uh, uh, I guess, connected to him. And when he passed, it was very devastating to me. I used to regret the thought of him having to leave us, but. Uh, Lawson Cathcart, who married Fanny Cathcart, my great grandmother who was born here. I commend them and all of us should commend them for, you know, for persevering through those difficult times and uh, yet uh, rearing their children. And, uh, and those of us who are alive today are actually standing on their shoulders. Uh, and we could never forget how we, why we are where we are today. Their dream and their aspiration had to be channeled down to us, to, what, to them, the future generation. So you are that hope that they hope for. And I believe that if you, the present day generation understood that they represent more than themselves, you represent the dreams, the hopes, the aspirations of your great, great grandfather or great grandfather who never got the opportunity. At the time of emancipation, there were over 80 African Americans on the Breton Plantation. Some stayed as sharecroppers while others left to start a new life away from the plantation. Resources were slim, but newly emancipated African Americans created avenues to support their families and embrace their newfound freedom. <laughs>